before I get started into my journey into AGAD, first of all, I just would like to thank all of you for being here. Uh, it's very important to me to see all of you, and I know and, and appreciate all of you, and I, I'm glad that you were able to make it and be able to watch us. So thank you guys, and you know, you're all awesome, and I appreciate that. So my journey into AGAD. So, a little bit about myself. I am from this itty bitty little town called Beach Creek. Um, it's about 40 minutes north of here. Uh, I lived there my whole life, and I grew up on a farm there, and so that's how I kind of developed a lot of my uh, interest in agriculture. I raised poultry, and uh, I've done a lot of different things on that farm over the years, and got to grow up and grow my own food, and got to be involved in my high school FFA. I went to Central Mountain High School, uh, my ag teachers were Amanda Hack, Paul Bonner, and John May. Um, and I was in the ag program all four years there, and I've taken classes in animal science and uh, ag mechanics and ag technology. So a lot of different interests there starting in high school. Um, everyone loves to hear the story of in this pet store where I work. Uh, <laughs> a lot of you know that that's probably how a lot of really good stories that you've heard from me start out as. So, uh, the name of that pet store is Calico Creek. Uh, I worked there for almost five years, so I uh, I really enjoyed what I did there, and you know I've worked with some incredible people that have really helped me along the way and helped guide me to where I am today. Um, and also, I would just like to thank my family too. Uh, my family has really been supportive of me over the years and has really um, guided me and, and watched me grow through this process. So, um, the school that I will be student teaching at this spring is Greenwood Middle High School. Uh, my cooperating teachers are Michael Clark and Krista Pontius. Uh, I'm looking forward to a really good spring with uh, those two and learning from them and you know, hoping to get some cool experiences this spring. So to answer the question, who do I aspire to be as a teacher? So, um, a little bit about my teaching philosophy. The goal of learning is not for the sake of just acquiring knowledge, uh, but rather it is so that we, what is learned may be applied to enhance our quality of life. What does that mean? We're not just learning for the sake of learning. We don't just sit in a classroom because that's what we're told to do. We're learning so that we can apply that in our lives and have a better quality of life for ourselves. So even if you think, oh, maybe ag isn't for me, or oh, this class isn't what I'm interested in, um, the purpose of learning in those contexts is maybe so that you can apply that knowledge elsewhere in life. Um, so a little bit about my classroom. Uh, I think that you're, um, in terms of management, I think that your expectations as a teacher are best kept short and broad. Uh, I believe that a lot of high schoolers don't like to be lectured at, they don't want lists. You know, we have enough syllabus, syllabi and lists in our high schools. Uh, I think just treating them as adults uh, and making your expectations clear uh, is key. So you want to have your procedures and your expectations set from the beginning. Uh, and when it comes to consequences, your consequences as a teacher should address the issue uh, and address the behavior. It shouldn't just be for the sake of punishing a student. And I, I really do believe in that as well. So a little bit about my expectations. These cool little posters here. So, my classroom expectations for my students are be respectful, be professional, be responsible, and be engaged. So, looking at each of those when we think be respectful, if you wouldn't want it done to yourself, don't do it to others. Uh, being professional, if it's not something that would work out in the work world, out in the real world, it wouldn't fly in a classroom. And I think that um, as an agriculture teacher and teaching in a career-based setting, uh, establishing that we are professional uh, is important thing with high school students. Be responsible. Uh, you know, you are responsible for your learning as a high school student and you know making sure that you take charge of your learning is important. And be engaged. So you know some days we have bad days and we don't feel like being engaged, but it's important that we give it our all and that we're present not just physically but also mentally in the classroom. So a little bit about my ideal program. Uh, teamwork makes the dream work. I really think that I teachers perform best when they can work with other I teachers, be that having a co-teacher with them or reaching out uh, 
through social media, through professional development. I think it's really important for an ag teacher to not just be a, a, a one-man show. I think that that's important that you can reach out and get some help. Um, as far as courses that I would like to offer, uh, it would differ depending on uh, what my standing in a high school would be versus you know, one teacher program or multiple teacher programs. Uh, if you had the capacity and the, uh, the, the manpower to teach multiple classes, like in a multi-teacher program, I would really like to see uh, a focus on a production pathway. So that would be like your uh, animal science, food science, biotechnology, uh, mechanics and power systems pathway. So that would be like your small gas engines, your welding, uh, tractor driving, and nat natural resource management pathway. Um, that would be like your wildlife and aquatics, that would be like forestry, uh, and, and things along those lines with uh, managing natural resources. And one cool thing, I actually kind of got this idea from the way that my high school did their ag classes, is they did a two period capstone class. Uh, I think that that's really cool because a lot of ag classes and a lot of ag labs get really uh, lengthy time-wise and they require a lot of input. So kind of using that as like your, your carrot, uh, for your seniors to keep them in the program, I think that that would be important as having like a, a two-period or multi-period class that they could engage with. Uh, if it was a single teacher program, I think that just the key to stick to there is just offer diverse content in agriculture. Uh, whether that's you offer multiple classes in one year, or you rotate and you offer different topics each year. Uh, when you're a single teacher, you have a little less capacity to, to be very specialized. Um, as far as my outlook on supervised ag experiences, uh, I think starting small is kind of important. So I didn't have as much uh, experience with supervised agriculture experience projects. So I think just starting small and taking an idea that it, a student might have in their head that you're really not sure which direction they want to go, but encouraging that, um, encouraging that free thinking, encouraging that creativity, letting them, letting students explore what they want to do. I think that that's important. And I think it's also important too to make connections in your community as an ag teacher because then that helps your students. You know, whenever you're looking at having students go out in placement interviews or uh, placement uh, positions, things like that, you want to make sure that you're making connections with those community stakeholders. Uh, and you definitely want to make sure that you showcase your students' participation, uh, make sure that the community and that those in your school can see how your students are uh, working in the capacity of these ag experiences. Um, as far as FFA integration, I think that it's really important in your uh, organization that you have some kind of a student recruitment committee uh, that looks at maybe working in a middle school or uh, doing outreach uh, activities that keep your uh, participation in FFA pretty high. I think it's really important to make sure that this is understood that it is a student-run organization. So it's not the ag teachers, it belongs to the students. Uh, and I think to being very specific in um, what audience you're trying to appeal to, making sure that you, you know, make those key connections, but also that you're welcoming to all students that would like to participate. So, um, I do have a short recruitment video uh, I wanted to share. Is that, am I able to? So this semester, we were tasked with putting together a, um, recruitment video for an FFA chapter, and um, this is a video that Manny Katala and I had put together uh, for recruitment.
Sniped. Get sniped. Oh my god. Okay, I'm sorry. Oh my god. 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 So I found the most interesting part of that whole video was not the little audio blurb at the end, but um, that was just a fun little video that we put together this semester as a project. The, the idea is that this, we have this idea for all that we are uh, looking for all students to find their place in FFA, not just the ones that we think would fit in, uh, but fitting the organization to find those students uh, is what we were going for with that video. So, uh, ways that we can, that I would look at uh, integrating my community is I think it's important to try new things. Uh, even if you think it's this crazy, bizarre idea, uh, reach out and, and give it a try. You never know, you know, if it, if it doesn't work the first time, you always give it a try then again the next time. Make changes and, and see what works. Uh, I think it's really important too to pay attention to what connections do your students have. You know, that's not just a burden that should be on the ag teacher to make connections, but a lot of your students have those connections. So it's important to figure out who your students know and how they can help you as well. Uh, it's also important to know your leaders. Uh, it's important to know who's making the decisions for your school, who's making the decisions in your community. Uh, you you want to put yourself in a position where you know who those people are and that you can reach out to them when you need to. Again, the idea of showcasing student achievement I think is very important. I think it's important to advertise your program to show off what it is that your students do. Uh, whenever you have community members seeing what good things you're doing in your program, they're much more likely to pitch in and, and give their support. So I'm going to switch gears here a little bit to some of my educational experiences at Penn State uh, and just and, and as a whole uh, that have helped prepare me as a teacher. So some classes that I have taken at Penn State that were of interest. Uh, one class that I found extremely helpful was Ag Ed and Extension uh, 311. That was our class on uh, FFA and supervised agriculture experience. That, uh, that was something that I really enjoyed learning from and I, I enjoyed the content of that class and I think that it will help me out really well in working with a chapter and getting students involved in those supervised Ag experience classes. Uh, one of my favorite ag classes outside of the major that I have taken is Animal Science 201. Uh, I really enjoy animal science. I really enjoy the content of that class, and I've really had some good experiences with that. Uh, and one class outside of the College of Ag that I really enjoyed was Organic Chemistry. Uh, I had a professor who was super energetic. She brought a lot of energy to class every day, and she just really was good at motivating students, and I took a lot from that because if you can get somebody to show up to Organic be engaged, you know something about teaching. So I really did enjoy that class as well. Uh, some professional development experiences that I've had. Uh, this uh, past month here, we traveled to the National Association of Agricultural Educators, I'll say that five times fast, uh, conference in San Antonio, Texas, and we had some really good workshops there. Uh, one of my favorite ones was the AgriScience Inquiry Institute workshops. Uh, we learned a lot about inquiry-based instruction. We learned about uh, student-led learning. I think that that was really important, and I had some uh, cool experiences in that as well. Uh, we had a communications workshop, which was, I thought was very valuable. I think it's really important to know that you have how to practice good communication skills and how to build relationships with your uh, stakeholders, your students, and your leaders. Uh, there was also a cool workshop we took on interactive notebooks. I think that, that was really interesting on how to kind of take just from the old plain Jane notebook and how to make that more interactive and more uh, integrated into your class for your students. So, some ways that I'm prepared to meet my students' needs. Uh, I think it's important to keep an open mind. Even if you don't have all of the knowledge of where a student's coming from or their background, I think just going in with an open mind and, and accepting that you don't know everything and that you are not always able to put yourself in your student's shoes, I think that that's important. I think it's also important to listen to understand and not just you know, check off boxes and think, okay, yeah, I hear you. You know, really listen to your students and make sure that you can understand where they're coming from. We had a diversity workshop, a diversity in the classroom workshop at NAAE. I really enjoyed it. Talked a lot about how to be mindful of cultural differences in your classroom. Uh, I think that that was really important. I learned some cool things at that workshop uh, on how to be mindful of those things. 
And I haven't had the opportunity to travel abroad, but just during our domestic study away to New England here this past spring, and um, we went to the NACTA conference in Nebraska with Dr. Curry this past spring as well, and to the National Association of Ag Educators conference here in San Antonio a few weeks ago. Uh, I'm not a big traveler, so those were things that really got me out of my comfort zone and kind of helped me <coughs> see that, hey, there is a whole world outside of just state college. And, you know, I think that whatever your comfort zone is, push it a little bit. So on to how do I plan to maximize my student teaching. So to start with this, just kind of set the stage with this a little bit, we have this magical, wonderful thing we call the process. And so this details the process from our time getting here to Ag Ed to the time we get out the door. And so you'll hear this a lot in this building, uh, the process. So a little bit about that process is that we start looking for cooperating centers. Uh, clear back last spring, we were looking at, at cooperating centers and, and even before that. I think that it's really important that you reach out to programs and teachers that you're interested in. I think it's important that you are honest with yourself about your strengths and weaknesses so that you can find somebody that will help you uh, to grow as a professional. I think it's also important to find teachers that you connect with and that you enjoy being around. Uh, and I think that it is also important, again, to step out of your comfort zone. You know, be a little bit frank with what it is that you need to learn and how you are going to go about that. So some classes and some uh, instructional topics that I'll be covering this spring. Uh, poultry and dairy. Any of you that know me know that I am super excited about that class. Uh, hydroponics and sustainable agriculture. I'm looking forward to that. I think we'll do some really cool things with building hydroponic systems and talking about ways that we can uh, be more sustainable in our food producing systems. Food science. I don't have a whole lot of experience in food science, so I really have looked forward to uh, going through this material and, and studying up myself and learning as I go along with this as well. Uh, concrete masonry and power tools, that is all kind of like in the landscaping class. I think that those are going to be some cool topics, do some cool hands-on projects working in those areas. Public speaking and parliamentary procedure. Um, I have had to learn a little bit about parliamentary procedure. I've had to kind of brush up on that, study that a little bit, but I think that that is a really interesting topic, and I actually am very much looking forward to teaching that. Uh, and wildlife and aquatics. I, I think we'll do some cool things with uh, wildlife ID and some wildlife projects in those classes as well. So to kind of reflect on who it is that I am as a teacher, what it is that I'm looking for, and how I plan to get that plan of exit in order to become the professional that I need to be. Um, one of the things that I think that I really would like to see myself work on is being more accepting of mistakes. Uh, I think that there is definitely an art to making mistakes. I think that it's really important that when you make mistakes that you can roll with them and that you don't let those get you down. And I, so I think I really have to work on letting go of that perfectionist mentality as a teacher. Um, another thing that I, I want to work on too is how do you make purposeful connections. Uh, I've seen some really good things in a lot of programs from teachers that are very intentional about their efforts to market their program. Uh, teachers that are really effective at using social media, which sometimes I am not always the best at keeping up with social media trends. So I think learning from teachers that are good at those things, I think that will, will benefit me a lot. So. That's a little bit about me, and that's kind of what I'm looking forward to in the spring. Um, I think that we'll, we'll have some good experiences to come. Ryan, are you ready for the question period? I think so. I think we are too. We will have an opportunity for questions from the live audience, from our virtual audience, and from the teacher education panel. And I think I'm going to choose uh, to ask a question very directly to you first, yes, I'm Ryan, from the teacher sure education so panel. Yes. As long as you stay in the blue box, we'll be happy. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan, um, I want you, and uh, you may have said it, but I want you to say it again. I want you to reframe it. I want you to address the question of what did you give to PSU Ag Ed 19? What was your contribution to the cohort? Uh, I have given a few lifts up to the commuter lot. <laughs> 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 but, um, <laughs> hey, yeah, that's a big thing. That's a big thing. Sorry, I'm walking. <laughs> uh, 
Um, I, that's a bit of a tricky question only because I think that those around me are in a better position to kind of judge that than myself, if that kind of makes sense. Uh, the, the way that I kind of try to contribute to the cohort is just trying to be an open person and trying to be there when somebody needs me. I am, I'm terrible at hunting people down and, and trying to get them something or figure out what they need, but I try to be that person that kind of is there that when they need to come to me, they can do so. So I hope that answers your question. I think that that's kind of what I, the position I've tried to put myself in to kind of serve uh, my cohort. No, it does not. Okay. And so I want you to try again. Okay. Because I'm going to tell you why. A common observation I've had of you, Ryan, is that you sell yourself short. You bring a set of expertise to your group and cohort. I do not want you to be afraid to brag on yourself. I want you to speak to what do you believe you contribute to the group as a base of expertise. Because I do know you have that expertise. Well, um, my, my base of expertise, uh, that's a pretty heavy word there. <laughs> um, I try to share my experiences uh, and the things that I have learned uh, along the way with others. I, I try to uh, share the things that I've learned. Um, one of the ways, too, I've, I've tried to help students is I... Uh, I'm actually this semester and last semester I was a teaching assistant for the Animal Science 201 class. Uh, and I really tried to reach out some, to students in that class and try to kind of gain a perspective of what it means to be a teacher maybe on the, uh, the college level. And I, I've had some really good experiences with that. And so I tried to uh, help others in our cohort along the way that have maybe needed some help with some of that material and then maybe needed some guidance to that. I, I tried to lend a hand in that way. Because you are a brilliant student and you do have insights to animal science. Thank you for sharing that. Are there any other questions from the live audience that's in the room that you'd like to ask Hunter, wildlife and fishery sciences major, Penn State, graduate 19, May 19? Yep. Uh, so, Ryan, great presentation, by the way. Thank you. Um, one of the things you touched on in there, um, you said one of the really important things in your program is going to be sharing student success and kind of showcasing. Um, I was wondering if you know how you're going to do that if you're going to go to student speech. Well, I, social media is a powerful force. Uh, and I know that um, you know that very well. You work very um, diligently here for the, the center. You've done a lot with that and reaching out over social media. I think that that's important is, is making sure that you reach a broad audience and make sure that people see the good things. Uh, over social media. I know that I am with teachers that are very good at that and are very intentional with that. And so I hope to kind of learn from them the best ways to capture students in the moment like that and capture them, you know, being successful and doing the things that they enjoy. And also how you are learning how to be intentional and how you market that and how you, how you showcase that. But I think the biggest thing too is just to, you know, when you want to see your students succeed, I think that that comes a little bit more Ryan, let's take a question from our virtual audience. All right, this one's from Caitlin. I would also point out that Greenwood and the students there are watching and contributing as well. The Greenwood gang is watching and supporting. All right, this question is, is from Caitlin. And she said, during your time here at Penn State, I know you were a TA for Dale's Animal Science 201 class. So my question to you is, what did you learn as a TA helping college students that you can apply to being a teacher? Well, uh, the one thing that I learned a little bit about college students that's a little bit different than high school is it doesn't really matter what time of the day it is. It could be in the middle of the afternoon and it might as well be 7 in the morning. Uh, so uh, sometimes I know that it's hard to be in the classroom and you have students all over the place, so I kind of, kind of appreciate that energy a little bit. Um, I, I think, too, that college students and, I don't know where I'm looking, uh, I think that it's also important to realize that too that people will kind of enjoy the same things whether you're an adult learner whether you're in elementary school high school this the things that make you that find that little spark the things that you enjoy uh, I 
think that those are things that are kind of universal across all boards, whoever you're teaching. I know in that class there's been quizzes that I'll hand back and I'll put a little sticker on them for the students. Like, you think that as a college kid you're like, oh, that's lame, but they really seem to enjoy that. And so maybe we kind of overestimate how those little things uh, pan out for people. So I think that that is what I've learned is that it's kind of a similar thing. I'd like to push a little bit. I know that surprises you. <laughs> but I'd like for you to identify a truism as someone who will be designing and delivering instruction that you think this is true regardless of whether you're 8, 18, 28, or 80? What's one thing you think is true across all age populations in regards to how you would want to deliver instruction? Well, I know that people love to be recognized. Uh, whether that's just a sticker on a quiz, whether that's, you know, you're the student of the month, whether that's an award at a banquet, however you decide to do that, students love to be recognized, anybody. You know, professionals in the field, they like to be recognized for their hard work. Uh, kids in elementary school, they like a sticker on their test or they like to have their name on the board. So I, I think that that's something that I've learned that's kind of true across all, all boards is that people really like to be recognized and appreciated. Thanks, Ryan. Dr. Curry, Dr. Ewing, who would like to ask a question? I'll go first. I'm gonna try again. Dr. Foster's failed attempt to make you try to talk good about yourself. Um, one of the most uh, rewarding parts about being an educator is that pe students come to you with their challenges, their difficulties, their successes, uh, and sometimes when that door is shut, there's some times that students have with you that you cherish for a very long time. And the reason why that's one of the most positive parts of being a teacher is that you realize that you're a very you're a positive role model in their life, oftentimes when they don't have any. So I want you to tell me some traits, some characteristics of Mr. Rupert that is going to make for a positive role model in that classroom. You don't talk. You think for a minute. <laughs> because I'm telling you that there's a bunch that I can come up with that's going to make Mr. Rupert a very positive role model for young people. I want you to tell me what some of those are. So while you're thinking, I want to rephrase because he's right on. When we get to the end of it, 15 weeks, and you're, you might be talking directly to some of these students at Greenwood that you want to say, hey, I hope that after 15 weeks they see this, that they replicate this, that they know I role model this. students to see a positive role model, but I also want them to see one that is okay with making mistakes, and is okay with learning, and is okay with picking up the pieces and, and keep on going. I think that that's important because I, I know and I have seen a lot of students get very stressed with themselves and get very competitive, uh, and I, I just try not to have that mentality. I really try to, the person that I try to compete against is myself. I really try to be a little bit better every day. And I, I really want to model that for my students, and I want them to know that no matter how bad it is, they can come to me because they know that I'm okay with making those mistakes and learning from them. So I, I want my students to feel comfortable with me as a teacher in that, in that capacity. You know, Ryan, Dale over caught me about a little bit ago and said the one adjective to describe Ryan Rupert is earnest. So I'd be proud of. And the adjective I'd add is authentic. Authentic and earnest in learning with. How about we go to our virtual audience? All right, this question comes from your virtual mentor, Becky Haddad. She said, great job, Ryan. You mentioned something that you're hoping to work on during your student teaching is to be more accepting of new things. How are you planning to give yourself space to be more accepting of, accepting of those new things? And how will you use your mistakes that they have adopted a mindset of learning from mistakes. Uh, 
I had gotten to go to national convention with them. I've been able to get their side and help them out with a lot of things. And I have really, really seen those two uh, deal with bumps in the road, which as a teacher, that's just something that we deal with. Uh, and it's honestly remarkable to be able to watch those two. It doesn't matter whatever happens, they just pick it right up and keep on going with it. And I am a person that I try to be that way, but sometimes I struggle with that a little bit. And I think I have some really good people in place that are going to help me uh, keep the ball rolling and, and adjust to those mistakes as well. And I think, too, reflection is a big thing. You know, sitting down at the end of the day or end of the week or whatever that is, recording what had happened during the week and ways that maybe you can fix that, writing over your lesson plans uh, so that you have that to go back to to make those changes when you come back to them. I think that that's important. Go to Dr. Ewing. I think he has a question that he's excited to ask. Well, I was, but I mean, everybody's already hit on it. We've talked a lot about mistakes with you, Ryan, and um, but that's kind of where I was planning to go with our discussion around, you know, your woodworking project, let's say, um, would be a highlight of the semester. I wish I would have thought to bring that to, to share with everyone, but, well, that's but, too bad. but, our, <laughs> but our, our students sometimes make mistakes reading the project plan, and they put, you know, one part on the exact opposite side of where it belongs, whatever it may be, they're, they're going to make those mistakes, right? Um, so I was going to go down that line, but and I think this still connects. So that happens in your classroom, and a, and a student comes up to you and says, uh, Mr. Rupert, why does mine look different than everyone else's? Um, you know, there's learning that occurred there, right? And I think um, we can all agree that, that learning matters. But I think the real question here is, um, if you could answer for me, um, do grades matter, or does learning matter? Mm. And what is the difference? Mm. <coughs> That's a good question. I can't believe we haven't asked that yet. I know. Year. I was thinking the same thing. <laughs> I mean, and, you, and I know you've heard about assessment and rubrics I I and all those fun things. Second. So, do grades matter? Does learning matter? Do grades matter, or does learning matter? And what's the difference? Well. Grades in learning aren't necessarily mutually exclusive. So you can have grades in learning, but the purpose of learning shouldn't be to earn a grade. Like a grade should not be the, the reward or the payment that you get for completing a certain objective. I look at grades as being a feedback or uh, something that you can look at as a student to improve on. I'm kind of new at this. I, you know, I've had negative one years of experience as a teacher, so I, I'm kind of hoping to maybe explore that. What are the best ways to grade? How do you, you know, use grades in a way that doesn't encourage them to do things just for a grade? Uh, so I, I think that they go hand in hand. It just depends on how you use the grades. I, I appreciate that answer because if we look back over your woodworking unit in 350, I understand that you ha you did receive a grade for that project, Ryan. I don't know if you looked on Canvas and saw it yet, but you received a grade. But I also know that learning occurred, right? It's important to read the project plan and to follow it. To put it another way, a lot of our core values for our Penn State Teacher Ed program, we want candidates that are focused on growth mm -hmm. that also recognize that, yes, there's a benchmark, but it's all about growing students from where they come when they get us. If a student knows absolutely nothing about woodworking, just because they can't make a fully furnished cabinet by the end of that semester doesn't mean they didn't grow. Or a bird box. Or, or a bird <laughs> box, if anyone else is watching. So. so focusing on growth as opposed to the actual benchmark for whatever. So thank you for your response, Ryan. I appreciate that. Is there a question from the audience here? I think that we've ignored that group. <laughs> and it looks like uh, Miss Libby Baker, uh, Mike Sola, a uh, plant science major at Penn State who happened to go to Greenwood, has a question. Yeah, um, Ryan, I absolutely loved your motivational, like, um, join FFA video. It was fantastic. Um, you said something afterwards about letting the organization fit the student. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that and why you believe that's important? Well, FFA is a student-led organization, and so it shouldn't be something that, as the ag teacher, you are, oh, this is my program, and this is the decisions that I want to see. And 
I, so I think that it's that giving that autonomy to students to say, this is what we want to do and here's how we're going to get it done, and being the advisor in a service role and saying, I will help you to get that done, uh, I think is a way that you can have the organization fit the students. And I think it's important too that you take steps to watch how much you um, model FFA as fitting a certain group of students. A lot of times we think of FFA as you have to come from a farm or you have to have animals or you have to, to grow something or have a tractor. And that's just not the case. You know, it just, it's no pun intended. <laughs> um, I, making sure that you are you're taking the steps to uh, have a program that is marketed towards all students and having a program that any student feels like that they could join. And I think that that's something that takes several years to have happen. And I think a lot of that involves a lot of self-reflection on you as an advisor and um, what preconceived notions that you carry with you into the program. Ms. Mori, let's pull a virtual question. Is this going to be our last virtual question? I don't know. I have two really good ones. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, go for it. Right, Give us one. This is going to come from Toby Neal. And he said that you mentioned the importance of community stakeholders in an agriculture program. What are some specific ways stakeholders can become a part of your program and invest in your students? Well, um, going off of that, one of the really cool things that I've seen at Greenwood is that they have an alumni uh, chapter for the FFA. And it's really cool because a lot of the people that, as students, they really invested in the program have the opportunity to come back to the program. Um, I, I know that the, the students at Greenwood, they know a lot of people. Millerstown is a very small area. Uh -huh. And so the, the uh, the students and the teachers there as well uh, make sure that they reach out to people in the community, that they reach out to people that have an interest in their program, um, and people that are, uh, they don't turn anyone away. Anyone that wants to help is more than welcome to do so. And so I think um, making yourself visible and making sure that you find out who's who and how you can connect with them is important. I'm going to steal one of those questions online and kind of adapt it. What's the one thing you just can't wait to do with students at Greenwood High School? Oh, boy. Okay. Uh, whatever. It's definitely going to involve chickens. So. <laughs> 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 it's, it's really chicken, so. <laughs> um, I think that's a I think doing a lot of hands-on learning is what I'm really looking forward to. Uh, it's really easy to get up in front of a room and do a lecture. Be and, specific. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what are we going to do that's hands-on that you've planned? You've done all this instructional planning. You've written unit plans. I've read some lesson plans. What's something that if I'm, if I'm taking ag at Greenwood and Mr. Rupert's going to be teaching me, what do I get to do? <laughs> uh, well, we, this spring hopefully we'll be hatching chickens. And yeah, yeah from an egg, an egg to a chicken. Uh, <laughs> that's kind of a fun thing. It's, it doesn't matter however your students are, whether they raise beef cattle or whatever, they will always be fascinated with this tiny little chick coming out of an egg. And I always look forward to doing that because I think that there's a lot to be learned with that and a lot of hands-on learning that occurs with that. What is that thing on the desk over there? Maybe? Yes. Okay. So this was my $15 shop project for Dr. Ewing's class. This is a watering wand that you will use to water your plants in the greenhouse bed, made out of PVC pipe. And it even has a brass end so you can put a hose on it and it won't burn the end off. And it will burn the whole thing. If I was t learning plumbing from Mr. Rupert at Greenwood in the spring, what's something that I might get to make in addition to a wand? I don't know. I just read a lesson plan. Uh, you know, going off of that lesson plan, I saw a cool little <laughs> project for a marshmallow shooter. You put a little marshmallow in and it's made out of PVC that you put together. And yeah. So I'm going to let the, get to learn PVC and make a marshmallow shooter with Mr. Rupert? Legal in 27 states. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, this project is kind of like a base work for a lot of different things that you could do. Uh, in my head, I thought that this would be kind of cool to do with different types of pipe, too, other than just PVC. So you could learn how to like, connect different pipes. Uh, 
one cool thing that I had thought about doing if, we, if I had taught a lesson on PVC and on plumbing uh, is give just have this big bowl of random pipe pieces and fittings and you take a piece and connect it and then you have to connect it to your neighbor who's connected to. And you just keep going right along until you have something and then we run water through it. So I think that that would be kind of fun. Could be. Very good. How about another question from our live audience? Uh-oh, Megan Royer's raising her hand. Megan is a member of PSU Ag Ed 22, I believe. 21. 21 or 22? We'll see how things go. Maybe. <laughs> 21 it is. Go ahead. Ryan. <laughs> so, Ryan, what is one thing that you think you've had to conquer conquer throughout your life that you think is going to help you become a better teacher? So what's one obstacle you've had to overcome that's going to make you a better teacher in the classroom? Well, um, for those of you that don't know me, um, I'm not a big traveler. I'm very much a homebody, and I never would have thought I would ever get on a plane. Uh, <laughs> but that's already happened four times now this semester, to and from uh, Nebraska and to and from San Antonio. That was a big thing for me. Uh, that was that was something that really got me out of my comfort zone, and I feel a little bit better about being able to do that as a teacher as a result. And it kind of makes the world a little bit smaller uh, as much as it makes it bigger at the same time. So I kind of developed that perspective, which kind of changed a lot of what I had brought here with me. Well, you should know that because of your interactions with Melanie Miller Foster, I believe that after you receive your job as a high school ag teacher, she does intend to take you to Eastern Europe in one way or the other. Oh, wow. So, um, uh, you, have, uh, you have inspired her uh, that we need to be working and looking ahead to that. Ryan, we enjoy you and we are proud of you. Um, we have reached that time, I think, for your last question. And everybody's last question is meant to be very unique to them to finish strong. I'm very personal to them. And yours is a 60 second question. Okay, so this is the elevator pitch, a little long elevator ride, maybe seven or so stores. 60 seconds. It's a slow elevator. Um, you're going to get the answer to this. Now, what I need you to do is I need you to step forward, Ryan, and I need you to stand on the front of that blue line, the, bl the thin blue line. Thin. And you are going to uh, look at that camera at the back because, uh, Ryan, this is going to be a really important question that you answer. And uh, the context is, quite frankly... I want you to pretend you're talking to Dr. Curry, Dr. Foster, and Dr. Ewing, who do get to mark down grades and determine if you graduate this fine institution and join our profession. And the first four, one, two, three, four, five, first four or five words, it's going to be, my name is Ryan Rupert. And then after you're going to tell me why we should believe that you will be a great ag teacher. So you can collect your thoughts. You're going to say, my name is Ryan Rupert, and I will be a great ag teacher because, and you have 60 seconds. There's quite a few more than five yeah, words there. Say. Thank you for making fun of me. <laughs> my name is Ryan Rupert, and I want to hear that answer. My name is Ryan Rupert, and I will be a great ag teacher because I care about my students and I enjoy what I do, and I am very passionate about teaching and learning, and I want to develop a, an attitude of lifelong learning in my students and myself as well. Let's give a round of applause for him.